Hello, everybody, and welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then Doris is going to be doing her talk, and you can ask questions on the chat, and we'll sort of answer when it's a good time to answer, and, you know, definitely we'd like to get them all answered before the webinar is over. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and um, it should be available within 24 hours on our YouTube, and I will put the link to our YouTube in the chat. Data Umbrella is a community for underrepresented persons in data science, and we are a nonprofit organization. A uh, little bit about me, I'm a statistician and data scientist, and you can find me at Reshma S on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub. We do have a code of conduct here. Uh, we'd like to pro uh, provide a welcoming and friendly community for all, and that applies to the chat as well. Um, there are various ways that you as a community can support Data Umbrella. The first is first and foremost is to follow our code of conduct um, and contribute to making it a welcoming and collaborative space. Uh, we also have a Discord uh, server where you can ask and answer general questions. You can also share events and jobs and you know, so anything you think the community might find helpful. Um, you can also donate to our nonprofit. Uh, we are on Open Collective as Data Umbrella. And if you work for a company that uses Benevity, which offers a company match, uh, you can also donate to Data Umbrella via your Benevity account that way. We have um, all of our videos on YouTube and we have a few playlists. Uh, one of them is contributing to open source. And so there are videos there on how to contribute to NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Pandas, Core Python. So check them out. We also have a video on career advice. We've had four excellent speakers. And um, if you're sort of, you know, want to learn more about that, uh, check out these videos. Uh, this is just a sampling of some of our other events that we've had. We also have a job board, jobs.dataumbrella.org. Feel free to check it out. And if you are hiring, uh, feel free to post jobs on it as well. Our website has a lot of resources on it, on open source, on using inclusive language, on accessibility and responsibility. And, you know, we um, encourage you to check it out and learn more about how this community um, was you know, founded and what we sort of aim to do. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella, and um, the ones that I have highlighted in yellow are the ones that we're most active on. So for instance, um, the best place to find out about the upcoming events for Data Umbrella is our meetup group, and the videos are all posted on YouTube, and we have a blog, and we have a monthly newsletter as well. Um, our next event is on December 7th, and it is entitled R, an ecosystem where Pythonistas can thrive, and I'm uh, really excited to have that event happen. Um, I have a couple of announcements for Data Umbrella. The first is, um, you can let me know in the chat, but I've been, um, for the live webinar, I've been told that closed captioning is available on the platform, so if you could see if you have that option, if you do, just put a note in the chat that you can. If you can't, also please just let me know and I can follow up with the, um, with the company and see about getting closed captioning working. Um, the second um, announcement that I have is we are doing a call for volunteer for our social media team. And so what it is, is we're looking for someone who can volunteer two hours a week to schedule our social media posts on a platform called Buffer. Um, it's a six month volunteer position and we um, are going, you know, we are here to mentor you for a few hours or, or more if you need it to um, to get started. Um, and, you know, if you, it does help if you have some experience with social media, whether it's on Twitter, or LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook, um, but it's not required. Um, and so if you're interested, please email us at info at dataumbrella.org. Today's talk is Lux, visualiza visualizing your pandas data frame with zero effort. A little bit about Doris. Doris Lee is a PhD graduate from the School of Information at UC Berkeley working on interactive data science tools. Um, Doris's website is dorisjunglinlee.com and these are the places where you can find her. It's, it's like Doris J. Lee on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. And with that, I will turn off my camera and mic and hand it over to Doris. 
Thank you so much for the introduction, Reshma. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And cool. Um, can you all see my uh, slides? I can't actually see the. Um, I can't actually see you guys, so maybe. Yes, uh, I, we, can see, we can see your slide. Okay, awesome. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, my name is Doris, and super super happy to speak at uh, Data Umbrella today to share some of our work on Lux, which is a tool that uh, me and some of my colleagues at UC Berkeley have built around. Um, improving the visualization experience for Panda's data frames. And so by a show of hands, uh, maybe we could use the thumbs up button on um, on, on the, the channel. Uh, maybe let's do a quick poll. How many of you have used or have heard of uh, Pandas? Cool. So I'm just seeing a couple um, yeses on the chat channel. So this is great. And so the, the focus of the talk today will be around uh, pandas data frames and it, essentially how do you visualize uh, your pandas data frames with uh, very little effort. And so many of you probably know that Pandas is a very popular Python data analysis library, which, um, which is really great because it comes with these intuitive and convenient set of APIs uh, to let users play around with their data. And so you can do things like data cleaning, uh, data, data wrangling, and even um, things like uh, group buys and combining um, your data sets together. And so, Pandas is really great because it has all of these uh, flexible APIs uh, for you to work with your data. And Pandas is especially useful when it comes to data exploration um, because it has uh, these, these various functionalities for loading, cleaning, transforming, and analyzing your data. And so during data exploration, uh, visualization is a way for users to ask questions about your data and then um, to essentially learn about the interesting patterns and trends that emerge. In terms of how this is done in practice, it's similar to what we're seeing on this uh, notebook, where data scientists would experiment with their data by writing pandas code alongside other, uh, using other um, Python libraries, uh, usually inside a, a Jupyter notebook environment. But even though the pandas data frame supports a wide variety of functionalities and operations, it's often not easy to figure out what analysis you actually need to take in order to get to your insights. And so even for a very simple task, such as visualizing this bar chart, there's still a very high effort that is required to visualize your data programmatically. So for example, first we need to think about, you know, what this visualization should look like, what graphical encoding and marks we should choose in order to process the data correctly. And then we need to translate all of these specification details into code. And so on the right-hand side here, we were seeing two examples of just the sheer amount of code that is necessary to generate a single visualization in Matplotly and uh, Matplotlib and Plotly, which is two very common uh, Python visualization libraries uh, that are used by data scientists. So oftentimes what happens in exploratory analysis is that just the sheer amount of programming effort that is required for visualizations often hinders the exploration, especially when the users only have a vague idea of what they're looking for. And so to address this pain point, what we've developed is a lightweight visualization tool on top of the Pandas data frame. And this is a tool called Lux. And the goal of Lux is to make it easier for data scientists to explore their data by automatically recommending useful and relevant visualizations to the users uh, when, whenever they're working with their data frames and printing out uh, their data frame. So without doing too much talking, I'm gonna just jump into a quick demo um, to showcase some of the features that we have in Lux. 
And so what we'll do is we'll be walking through a notebook example. Um, you can either try this out on your own via this link, or you could follow along uh, on my screen. So I'll be walking through this notebook. Um, and so if you if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, post it on the, the Q&A and uh, we can talk about uh, some of, we can address these questions. So uh, you're probably seeing my notebook at this point. Um, so this is um, what I have right now is I have, um, I have a Jupyter notebook. So very similar to what probably some of you are familiar with in whenever you're analyzing your data, um, you're in a Jupyter notebook like environment. And in order to use Lux, um, what I have to do is I add a single line import Lux alongside my import pandas. Um, when I when I import Lux, what happens is I can continue to use the same API that I'm using with pandas. So for example, in this case, I'm loading in a data set using the same command, uh, pd.readcsv. So I'm loading in a data set with information about um, uh, different countries and um, metrics related to different countries. So what we see here is whenever we print out a data frame, uh, we not only see the uh, the table that is returned to us by pandas. So these are showcasing rows and columns of my data set. I also get this additional button on the top left hand side. So what happens when I click on to this um, button? I actually get a set of visualizations that are automatically recommended to me. So these show me things like correlations in my data set. So correlations are pairwise relationships across different attributes. So we can look at um, trends that are most correlated. So for example, average well-being and inequality adjusted well-being. These are all things that are highly correlated versus trends that are more dispersed and less correlated. We can also take a look at all the univariate distributions in my data set. So these distributions are ranked based on ones that are most highly skewed. So you could see that population and GDP per capita, these are, these are values that are very uh, highly skewed to ones that are more uniform. So for example, you know, the, the, some of these other metrics are more, follow a more uniform distribution. And we could also look at occurrences, which are bar charts, as well as um, even geographical maps that are based on my data. So we can already see that some of these, um, some of these visualizations are already telling us a much more richer and visual story compared to kind of the textual views that we, uh, we get automatically by default through pandas. So that's kind of the basic of Lux. Um, and one of the really nice things also that Lux allows you to do is, as I mentioned before, you, you can still use the same um, API that you're familiar with in pandas. All, all the you know 600 or so um, APIs that you're familiar with to do things like data cleaning. So these are just some examples of, you know, I'm, I'm going through all of these examples to, to kind of clean up my data set, print it out, and I'm just gonna run through these really quickly and showcase kind of the diversity of APIs that you can use alongside Lux. So after all of these uh, data cleaning operations, I can then print out my data frame again and then examine kind of the patterns that are generated based on these this updated data frame. So looking at this data set again, one of the things I find is that there's an interesting sort of negative correlation between average life expectancy and inequality. So this is a negative correlation. And we think that this is kind of an interesting trend. So we want to learn more. So how do we how do we kind of steer Lux towards the visualizations that we're interested in? So in Lux, we have this notion of an intent language. And what an intent is, is a very high level um, specification of what you're interested in, whether it's data attributes or values. So in this case, uh, what we're interested in 
is inequality and average life expectancy. And we can specify this uh, in terms of uh, strings in a list in, in Lux. So we would say df.intent equals to inequality and average life expectancy. And so what happens here is when we print out the data frame again, Lux automatically takes in this knowledge of what we're interested in and shows you visualizations that might be relevant to that. So as we can see on the left-hand side, because we've specified inequality and average life expectancy, we see this on the left-hand side. Sorry, just uh, zooming out a level. And so on the left-hand side, we see the visualizations that we ask for. On the right-hand side, we see all the visualizations that are related to that. So for example, in the Enhanced tab, we essentially see all the visualizations where we add an additional attribute. So for example, we can break down this trend based on whether a country is landlocked, whether a country is a G10 country or not, uh, based on what region the country is located at, and so on. We can also take a look at all the visualizations where we're adding an additional um, filter to look at subsets of the data set. So for example, we can look at, you know, based on where the country is, uh, what, where the country is located, the number of, of bordering countries that, um, that that country has, and so on. We can also take a look at um, taking a step back, the unit variate distributions that are uh, based on this trend. So we can look at the univariate distributions of inequality and average life expectancy. So this is essentially, you can add an additional attribute, add an additional filter, or take a step back and examine the overall trend. So the intent is a high level language that allows us to specify this with Lux and have a dialogue with, um, with Lux about where, um, where you wanna steer your analysis. And so one of the really nice things about Lux is that um, you not only can you look at visualizations based on a data frame, you can actually quickly inspect uh, things like your series object, which is a one-dimensional um, one dimensional uh, version of a data frame. So in this case, um, we were looking at the, the Happy Planet Index, which contains information about each country. Um, and now we wanted to load in some information about the countries and their intervention strategy with uh, with COVID-19. So we, we load in this data set called COVID. And um, one of the things that we, that if we print out the data set, which is a data frame, we see that this, um, this data set contains things like day uh, stringency, which is the score that is related to how strict is the, com uh, the country's intervention strategy uh, based on a score of zero to 100, where 100 is the highest um, level of stringency um, in terms of the intervention strategy. And so let's say that we're interested in the column day. Um, so we can print out this one dimensional series, but not only that, when we toggle to uh, Lux, we could actually see various temporal patterns being generated based on that one dimensional series. And we can also do the same thing for things like um, stringency. Uh, so the stringency score, which will show us kind of a distribution of values. And so this is this is very convenient because now we have a way of very quickly inspecting not only what's within the data frame, but a one-dimensional series um, or column based on based on our data. And related to the idea that we can very quickly examine what's in our data frame, one of the things that Lux also allows you to do is to be able to experiment with visualizations without writing too much code. So in Lux, we have this concept of a viz object. And the viz object is essentially something where you can specify a high level intent, very similar to what we saw earlier with steering uh, Lux towards towards you know, attributes or values that you're interested in. But in this case, the viz object is essentially saying, this is exactly the visualization that I want to look at. So let's say that we are interested in the stringency score. Um, we can enter that in and create a visualization 
based on stringency and then COVID is the name of our data frame. And so we can very quickly plot this uh, histogram without even telling Lux that, you know, we need to plot a histogram or how do you actually process the data to get to this visualization? All we have to specify is the attributes and values that we're interested in. And this becomes really convenient because not only do you not have to write all of this code to generate this single visualization, it's essentially a one line specification, but it's also convenient when you are working with your data set and let's say maybe you filter your overall data frame, uh, the COVID data frame, and let's say we're only interested in records on March 11th, uh, 2020, which is very early on in the pandemic. So we filtered our data frame and we can very easily update our uh, visualization. And immediately what we can see is the same visualization based on stringency generated based on the overall data frame and the early data frame is quite different. So early on, um, we can see that overall the, the distribution is sort of this, like it peaks at around 60 to 80. Um, but early on in the pandemic, most countries have kind of a low stringency scores. Um, so that's already some really interesting insight that we can get by just specifying a single line of um, visualize, uh, using a single line of code to create our visualizations. Okay, so one of the things that we mentioned earlier is that Lux, uh, because it very tightly couples with pandas, it allows us to use the same pandas API as, um, as we do uh, with, if we're just using uh, pandas without Lux. And we can, what we can do is we can actually merge this early data frame, so the, the early data frame based on the filter with our original data frame DF. And so we can use the same command and, and essentially set, print out the resulting data frame again. And so we set the intent as stringency. And one of the things that we get on the left-hand side, again, is the univariate distribution based on uh, stringency star. But we also get all of this uh, interesting information around stringency. So we could actually see a geographical map of the stringency scores, as well as the distributions and so on. So one of the things, because the stringency score is a numerical value, and one of the things we want to distinguish is countries that have kind of these very dark uh, stringency scores, so very high stringency score versus countries with low stringency scores. Um, so what we can do is we can bucket the countries based on the stringency score. So we use the command pd.qcut, which is which divides the stringency based on uh, the the quartile. So we we bin it based on whether it's low or high. So we now have this, uh, if we print out the data frame, we now have this extra column called the stringency value. And it's either, a country is either high stringency score or low stringency score. Um, we could also, as we, sh we saw earlier, uh, print out the 1D series and then get a sense of you know, how many country is it, is it in each bin? So going back to our earlier intent around um, the negative correlation between inequality and average life expectancy. Now, if we set that intent on our current more updated data frame, what we see is again, the same visualization on the left-hand side, but we what we see on the right-hand side is Again, like we can add an additional attribute based on this, uh, this, this uh, relationship that we're seeing. So one of the really interesting thing that we're seeing is that the for the countries with a very high stringency level, they tend to be on the top left hand side of of this chart, whereas countries with low stringency levels tend to be these orange dots on the right hand side. But what is also interesting is that there are these three sort of outliers that doesn't necessarily follow the trend. So this is this is something really interesting. And 
and what we can do is um if we actually take a look at this even closer so if we pin down uh, these three countries that are outliers we can see that th these correspond to afghanistan pakistan and rwanda and if you actually do some research into um uh the pandemic responses at these uh for these countries these countries were praised for their early pandemic efforts despite having limited resources so this is a case where mixing together both the visual view which is the the visualizations that are automatically recommended to us and the tabular view where we can filter down and take a look at these individual records both of them can work together uh you know side by side to be able to help us with getting a deeper insight into what's going on with our data. And so going back to our earlier data frame um, and the results here, let's say that this is, as we talked about, this is a very interesting insight where there's some outliers in my data set. And let's say that I wanted to, you know, send this to one of my colleagues and, you know, talk about my results. So what I can do with Lux is I can click on this visualization and be able to kind of export this visualization and share it with others. So I, I just clicked on this visualization that I'm interested in. And on the top right hand side here, I have an export button. So when I click on the export button, this allows me to export it programmatically into a variable called exported. So my data frame is called result and result.exported essentially gives me this visualization that I selected. And this is really nice now because I have a programmatic way of accessing this visualization, which allows me to do things like um, take this visualization object and print it as code. So I can either do this in Altair, which is a visualization library in Python, or many of you are probably more familiar with matplotlib. So let me just try this. Um, so I could do the same thing where I can take the visualization and plot it into matplotlib code. And what is really nice now is then I can copy and paste this code that is automatically generated uh, based on my visualization. And we can paste it into a different cell. And essentially, okay, actually, let me just change the name of the data frame and essentially reproduce the exact same thing that we are getting with uh, what is recommended to us. So this is the exact same visualization, but now we have a way of uh, getting all the code that is necessary to generate that. And this is super nice because then I can go into this code, make some changes. And here I've made some changes related to the title and adding some labels for these outliers. Then I can take the the final presentation ready uh, graphics and share it with my colleagues. So this is at a very high level how I can go from, you know, uh, how I can go from sort of the tabular. Let's see, this is the, how I can go from the tabular view, which is just the rows and columns that Lux is showing me uh, by default, to a set of recommended visualizations that I can then. Um, select, browse through, and then share with my colleagues. Uh, let's see. So, screen. Okay. So, hopping back to the slides now. Um, hopefully, the the demo uh, kind of helped uh, explain some of the core concepts in Lux and how you can use it within your data analysis workflows. And one of the things I wanted to add is that um, Lux is actually based on a lot of the research that I've done as part of my PhD, as well as the work done by many of my colleagues at UC Berkeley. Uh, and part of my dissertation work was around studying how to better design automatic uh, you know, support and assistant to help data scientists in the process of visual data exploration. And Lux is sort of a culmination of the research uh, that we've done across many different tools into something that is lightweight and usable and fits very well within the Python and Jupyter ecosystem. So if you're in interested in how the magic is done underneath the hoods um, and some of the optimizations that we've developed, 
feel free to check out our paper at this link. So hopefully the demo kind of uh, illustrated how a very typical data analysis workflow where we're working with data frames within a Jupyter notebook can be completely transformed by just adding a sing single import statement. And all we, the only difference between you know, a, a purely pandas based, based uh, uh, notebook workflow and what we're seeing here is the single line of import. And with Lux, working with data frame now means affording a lot more visual richness to encourage these types of meaningful exploration. And first of all, what we saw is that by printing out the data frame, Lux automatically recommends visualizations essentially for free to users. Um, Lux provides this alternative way that data frames can be visualized at any point in their analysis. And the visualization is always on in the sense that users can always toggle back and forth between these complementary views, the table view and the visual view. And sometimes there are tasks that are more amenable in this table view. So for example, if you wanna get structural schema information about the data frame, or as we saw in the demo, looking at individual records in the data frame. And in other cases, the visualizations may be more useful to get a quick visual overview of our data. We also saw in the demo that we can do all of the visual, um, we could all do all the visualization capabilities and uh, nice uh, recommended visualizations with Lux while preserving exactly the same data frame commands that we would typically use in Pandas, meaning that all the nice uh, 600 or so API and functionalities that we would get from Pandas, we could still get with Lux without having to change any of our Pandas code. And this is really nice because all of a sudden now we can do data cleaning and transformation completely within our Jupyter notebooks and as well as visualization. So typically we would actually have to move to a separate BI tool or write a lot of code to be able to visualize our data. Um, now we can do it all within the notebook environment and update our visualizations right away. We also saw how data frames can be attached to an intent, which enriches the data frame with signals about what visualizations we should show to the users that are more and more relevant to their analysis interests. So Lux features this language, this expressive um, intent language that allows users to specify their analysis intent in a very sloppy way. So for example, in this case, inequality and average life expectancy, and Lux automatically infers some of these underspecified details and determines the appropriate visualization mappings based on a set of best practices and visual encoding rules so that you don't actually need to go in and write the code uh, necessary to do um, to, to plot these visualizations. And finally, we also saw that there is a very quick and easy way to create visualizations on demand. So Lux is sort of built on this principle that users should always be able to explore anything that they specify without having to think about what the visualization should look like. So in our demo, we wanted to take a look at how the stringency metric uh, changes, uh, the, how the stringency metric looks like overall. And so Lux shows us a histogram in return. And then we applied a filter to the data to take a look at how the same visualization has changed. So we immediately kind of saw how the same visualization with a modified data set changes the, the overall uh, visualization that was displayed. And we can also do things like add an additional um, attribute. So for example, if we want to look at stringency by day, that's something that we can also plot. Or maybe we want to look at all the visualizations that is that involves the stringency attribute. So we could also specify that through Lux as a set of visualizations that we're interested in. So for more details on the intent language and how the specification works, um, we have some of this in our documentation. Um, so all of these experimentation with the visualization is just by tweaking a single line of code. Uh, we can, again, we can we can add an additional uh, time dimension or look at all of the other visualizations. And so essentially popping up a level higher, 
what Lux does is that it provides this abstraction to let people create visualizations more easily without having to think at the level of code. But we can now work with the data directly uh, around the concepts that is related to the data. And finally, what we saw is that users can export their users can take the data frame visualizations that are shown to them, and they can either share it to an interactive report. Um, this is not something that I showed in the demo, but you could actually do df.2 HTML or save save as HTML and um, export the visualizations that you're seeing into an interactive dashboard such as a streamlit or panel. Uh, or you can click on one or more visualization similar to what we did in the demo and export them as code. And you can edit these visualizations further in your Jupyter notebook and then share it with your colleague. And Lux currently supports uh, translating the visualizations down to Matplotlib, Altair, or Vega Lite code. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that uh, Lux has a very uh, active open source community. Um, we we released Lux uh, last year in October, and we've already seen a lot of uh, growing interest in the community and using these tools. Um, and it's really amazing to see kind of the potential and its applications in real world data analysis. So to date, um, Lux has been downloaded more than 60,000 times and has over 3,000 stars on GitHub. And many of, uh, and, and these tools are adopted by data scientists and practitioners spanning a wide range of industries to really help them with the visual exploration experience. So at this point, you're probably thinking, Lux is really cool. How do I get started and uh, use this in my you know, day-to-day -day, uh, data science workflow. And so to get started, you can follow this GitHub link to the README instructions on our GitHub page. And Lux is a very simple one-line install. So you could either get this via pip or conda. So you could just do pip install Lux API, or there's, a, there's an equivalent conda install instruction. Uh, and we also support various notebook front ends. So Lux currently supports Jupyter Lab, the classic Jupyter Notebook, as well as VS Code. Um, and there's different installation and setup instructions for those. OK, so just to kind of recap, um, in this talk, we've seen how Lux is an automatic tool that supports visualization and discovery alongside a data frame workflow. And I hope that this presentation gives you a taste of how Lux can help you enhance your data exploration experience within Notebook through a very low barrier way in working with visualizations. Again, if you're interested in using the tool, uh, check out our GitHub page for the README instructions. And I'm also happy to take questions with the remaining time. Doris, thanks so much for the presentation. It is, um, it's really, really like, amazing. I'm so excited to um, like get started and use it. Um, I, I, there are some questions in the Q&A, and I will start mm -hmm. with the first one, which is, would it work within our studio environment? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, thank you, Priyanka, for, for asking that question. Um, Lux doesn't currently support uh, the our studio environment uh, because it's largely based uh, on the Pandas data frame. It doesn't yet do that, but it does support some of the common um, IDEs that folks are using for Python, including Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Lab, um, and VS Code. The next question is: What pre-processing should we do on our data frames before we use Lux on it? Yeah. Um, Thank you, Sahir, for um, asking that question. Um, that's a that's a really great point. So during exploratory data analysis, there's often some sort of pre-processing step before you visualize your data. And one of our motivation in actually creating Lux is that we, we shouldn't have to um, spend too much effort in cleaning up your data 
in order to visualize your data uh, very easily. So in Lux, we actually spent a lot of time making sure that when you load in that data frame, even if it's, you know, contains missing value, even if it has mixed types or various d different, you know, dirty uh, data that is within your, um, not within your data frame, we have the capability of visualizing it. And the reason why we decided to do this is that visualization is actually a very important step uh, in which can actually help you with your data cleaning and uh, data wrangling uh, or feature engineering steps. So we believe that being able to visualize your data at all time, even before the cleaning step or after the cleaning step uh, is a very valuable thing. And it is something that we, um, we try to support in Lux. The next question is, um, I am curious, what is it driven by under the hood? Is it NLP? Yeah, that is a very good question. So Lux is, the, the way that the recommendations work in Lux is that um, we've developed this model where for every step in your data analysis workflow, you either have a generic interest on the data set, which is, you know, I want to see an overview of the data set, in which case we would show things like correlations and uh, distributions and so on. So some of the things I showed in our initial screen. And then with what the users have specified, um, we can actually interpret the intent language um, based on a set of, um, we, we can, we can in interpret the intent language and determine, you know, a set of visualizations that are relevant to that. And these are based on some of the best practices and research in the visualization um, literature based on what is what is what are good things to show to the users at every point in the analysis. So a lot of the um, the work that we're showing here is based on those heuristics and best practices. Um, it doesn't currently rely on any machine learning or um, any super elaborate uh, models underneath the hoods. It's actually just a very basic um, uh, a sorting and ranking based on um, certain interestingness metrics. So for example, correlation or distribution scores, those are the things that we're using to rank and sh display the visualizations. The next question is, what are the available idioms within Lux for the data quiz? Um, I'm actually not too sure what the idioms is referring to, but if I understand correctly, I, I'm just going to take a guess and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, maybe the idioms refer to the intent language uh, that I that I covered. So the the, again, the intent language is a high level way of specifying uh, what the user is interested in in the data set. So for example, I can specify that I'm interested in these particular attributes. So you could you could either specify one or more attribute up to three attributes. Um, you could also specify things like filter. So for example, I might be interested in, you know, the countries that are in North America. So that's an additional like filter that you can add to the attribute specification that you um, that you outline. One of the things that I mentioned is that we have this paper um, and this paper actually goes into the details of what, what are the allowable sets of um, intents that we support in this language are um, our documentation page also covers some of these. And so you can actually do very elaborate things like, hey, I want to take this list of specification and, you know, multiply it by another list of specification. So maybe I could I could actually specify things like, you know, show me everything in the in the data sets that's related to um, this particular attributes, for example, like stringency. Um, so Lux will actually iterate through all the possible visualizations based on that combination. So if you're interested in more details, um, 
I'm happy to follow up with the uh, documentation link to the page where we talk about uh, stringent, uh, sorry, where we talk about the uh, intent API. So, Boris, I, um, I have a question for you, which is related to the open source aspect of this project, which is, um, how is it funded? So, this work was mostly done during my PhD. Um, and so it was, I, I don't think it was, it was largely unfunded, other than the fact that I'm working on it. And some of the students that um, are part of the lab, we, we kind of worked on it together. So I guess my question is, what is the future of it? Like who will, who will continue to fund it? Will, will the lab continue to fund it? Uh, most of most of this is like based on uh, volunteering work at this point, I think. Um, so we're we're continuing to work on it, um, and there's a couple students at Berkeley that are still contributing, and we're always looking for you know open source contributors uh, for you know to continue to work on um, this tool. Okay, and can you? Uh, we talked a bit about this in the beginning, but. Uh, you know, would you say that this is a library that is um, that people can contribute to as beginners um, versus, like, say, something like Scikit-Learn, which can, which is a very um, it's a ten year old library. So, the, you know, contributing to that is not it's not as easy. Yeah, definitely. I think for Lux, there are definitely components where you know we 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 welcome uh, you know first time contributors to help with. We have a pretty um, well documented set of uh, contributing guide on you know things that would benefit from open source contribution. We also have a special tag, I believe, on the issues page that outlines the tasks that are um, good for first time committers or um, newcomers to the project. That you know around documentation and um, basic uh, basic issues where uh, we would definitely love open source contributions. So there is one question in the chat that I can't translate from Spanish. Let's see, debemos acostumbres a alimentos? Something about should we something, this type of analysis, but I can't, I don't know the question. If somebody can translate the question, um, I'm happy to read it. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't read Spanish either. <laughs> so if, if there's a translation, I'm happy to answer the question. Lucy, are you able to put a translation in the chat? So the question was, should we get used to this type of tools for information analysis? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the question is asking, but um, this is like the goal of developing Lux is to, to make sure that um, the, you know, the kind of the visual exploration process is something where it's collaborative with the system so that it, the onus is not always on the user to specify everything that is necessary to visualize your data. And so like part of my vision for the future of data analysis and information analysis is that, um, is that in the future, it should be easier for a data analyst or data scientist to be able to visualize their data, both in a very flexible way, so they could still do all the things that they wanna be able to do with their data, whether it's data wrangling or cleaning or feature engineering, uh, but also be able to um, automate some of the very tedious or um, uh, 
common things that all data scientists are doing in terms of you know visualizing your data and making it easy to uh, explore your data in a in a systematic way so that's kind of the goal of lux um and i think at least in terms of like the vision for the future i definitely think that tools like this where we're generating more um uh, visual insights for the user is something that we might see more and more uh, in the future yeah that's great thank you um yeah i would say you know from when i started working with python which was in 2013 i think there's a lot of tools that make um, that make it a lot easier to do things a lot of libraries so so it's a yeah. it's direction that it's going in for users as well mm -hmm. And there's a comment that says, in my opinion, they, these tools will help us a lot in the training of future data scientists. I see that this discipline will be more accessible. Um, yes, I, I do agree with that as well. Um, there's, a, there's one more question, which is, can Lux produce box, box whisker chart? So Lux doesn't currently support box and whisk, whisker charts. It's actually an open issue that uh, we've wanted to work on for a long time. So this is definitely an area where we would love uh, contributions um, if you're interested in tackling this issue. Um, so Lux currently only supports uh, bar charts, line charts, um, histograms, and geographical maps. So you saw some examples of the geographical maps in, um, in our demo today. Um, but future chart types, other more elaborate or advanced chart types is definitely something that we're interested in extending. And Lux, uh, as a library, has a very easy and extensible way of creating additional chart types. Um, so it's something that we're looking forward to in the future. Um, that's great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, for doing this presentation for our community and um, you know joining us. Um, I know it's early and on the West Coast, so thank you so much. Um, thank and, you. So, and so um, I'm going to post the recording uh, within a day. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I plan to watch this again um, a couple of times and uh, get started using Lux. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining the talk today.